All right, well, let me kick this off. Uh, welcome everyone to our FinTech uh, event for June. So, um, so FinTech Realtech Meetup, we're a special interest group under the Silicon Valley AAII group. And you know, our purpose is to discuss current and emerging trends in finance and technologies and, and how consumers can benefit. So you could find more about us and also sign up to get notice of future events at this meetup.com. Um, slash fintech realtech. And as a special interest group under Silicon Valley AAII, uh, this, is the, uh, this is our website. You can get, also get more information about other events. Um, let me just admit some folks that are in the waiting room there. And uh, they have some upcoming events, but I'll, I'll also share a little bit about um, you know, what we have going for, going for the summer. So um, summer uh, for our main events, we're going to be on break. And um, the next event for the, for the main event is going to be September 19th with Christina Kirpina. So she's going to talk about the economy, COVID-19, and the elections, and then also emerging tech uh, and other trends. And then um, we will have an October and November meeting, and then we're off for December. So we've got... Um, some upcoming, um, so these are um, our special interest groups. So the financial planning with Fred Smith, they're on summer break. And uh, Lynn's gonna continue with his general investing discussion. The next one is gonna be July 27th. So it's always the fourth Monday of the month. And then uh, we'll have our, uh, our next FinTech Real Tech event on July 30th. Um, we've got some, uh, some guest speakers lined up, but uh, it's still TBD. We're, you know, uh, finalizing the topic there. So we have several. So introduction for David. So David started Portfolio Armor 10 years ago and as a, as an, as a tool to help investors to hedge risk. Now, David, I understand that you work with um, some professors on developing this technology. And um, I think you said one of them is at the Claremont College right now, is that right? That's correct. Yep. When I worked with him, he was at Rutgers and then at Princeton at their, um, he was a postdoctoral fellow in their uh, financial engineering department. Right, that's awesome, yep. So, um, so before uh, Portfolio Armor, he worked in the financial services uh, from wholesaling and in the mutual fund for a mutual fund company, and then also did some business development at a fintech startup. So um, before we begin, just one last note, if you can mute your audio, uh, turn off your camera just so that uh, we could save, um, you know, save on the bandwidth and uh, enjoy yourself. And I'm gonna let additional people into the room. All right, David, take it away. I'm gonna, you can go ahead and take control or let me just, uh, you should be, let me just, uh, how do I? Admit Muriel Morali. There you go, I admitted Oh, did Morali. you? Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks a lot, Roland. I appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who has uh, joined the meeting. I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen to the presentation, and you'll be able to see it. And then afterwards, I'll be happy to take any questions everyone has. Take uh, any questions you guys have. Okay. Um, I wanted to start with just a definition of hedging because people tend to mean different things from it. So, and the reason why I put this on the slide, this definition, a hedge is something that always goes up in value when the underlying security goes down in value significantly. The reason why I put that there is people sometimes informally use hedge in the sense that, oh, I bought some gold as a hedge or I bought some Bitcoin as a hedge. But there are instances where, for example, the stock market could decline significantly and Bitcoin necessarily won't go up. And that's also true of, of gold or bonds. So because they don't always go up when the thing you're looking to hedge is going down, I would not consider those hedges. They may reduce risk to some extent as a form of asset allocation, but they're not strictly hedges. Now, now we get to the point of why hedging to hedge individual stocks. And there's a really good JP Morgan study. I was going to include the link here, but 
it doesn't appear to be active anymore. But basically what they did was they looked at the Russell 3000, which is, I think it covers about 95% of the publicly traded stocks in America. It's, it's not just the big ones, it's across the board. And they looked at them over a time frame from 1980 to 2014, and they found out 40% of those stocks had suffered what they defined as catastrophic losses. And their definition was a decline of 70% or more without recovering. And this wasn't limited to any particular uh, sector, but I know it's of interest to, to this group being in Silicon Valley, 57% of information technology stocks experienced catastrophic declines during that period as well. And some examples of black swans that, um, I guess they're, they're kind of obvious over the last 15 years or so, the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, I remember, I think the day that Bear Stearns announced that they were on the verge of bankruptcy, there was a very prominent CNBC commentator who, or actually I think he was a mutual fund manager, who said they were fine. And this was really a black swan. A lot of people didn't consider how fragile some of these financial stocks were. Another example too is COVID-19 this year, and not just the disease, but the lockdowns associated with it. And I mentioned on the slide here, cruise ships, that's obvious because their business was completely shut down. And REITs, real estate investment trusts, is, is another example, which is a little bit more of a domino effect. Uh, real estate investment trusts, many of them own things like shopping malls. And within the shopping malls, in addition to the stores, which were closed, you have restaurants. And I assume some of you follow the news in recent months, uh, there was news that uh, Cheesecake Factory, for example, said it wasn't going to pay its rent to its landlords, which are the real estate investment trusts. So a lot of investors purchased real estate investment trusts as conservative investments, and they really got hammered in the last few months due to COVID-19, the associated lockdowns. The last point I put on here is antitrust action. And I, and I think that's of particular relevance to Silicon Valley because a lot of the Silicon Valley companies such as Google, Facebook, um, et cetera, right now they appear to be unstoppable. And the only foreseeable obstacle I see to them on the horizon is the prospect of antitrust action. So that would be a black swan if that happens and I think there's really no stock out there that you're guaranteed not to suffer losses in given the black swan. So the next question we get to is, well, what if you're well diversified and you're invested in the stock market? Stock market might correct, but of course it always comes right back. I mean, we're already making new highs now after the, uh, after the COVID-19 crash in March. And I use this, black rain slide to remind me of why it's important to hedge market risk. Black rain was a movie that came out, I put the date on here, September 18th, 1989. It was about two New York cops who had to return a fugitive to Japan and it gets complicated from there. But here's the reason that I brought it up. If you look at the Nikkei 225 today, it's still below where it was when that movie came out in September of 1989. So 31 years later, the Japanese stock market has not recovered. Now, Japan is an important example here because it illustrates the disconnect between markets and, and the real economy. If you look at Japan from 1989 until today, they built more trains, they built more highways, they built more buildings. In many ways, it's a very prosperous country. It has some of the best infrastructure in the world. So when people say, oh, the stock market can't be down for that, much, that long because our economy is strong fundamentally, well, Japan's economy is strong fundamentally, and yet their stock market has not recovered its 1989 highs. So. I'm not predicting that we're gonna have a 30 year long bear market in the United States. I honestly have no idea. But the reason why I'm putting the slide here is I wouldn't rule out the possibility of that happening. It's not beyond the realm of possibility. Something like that happened 
after the Great Depression in the United States, where according to some measures, we didn't regain market highs until uh, about 1950 or so. And Japan is still, as I said, has not regained its highs from the late 80s. So what's the best way to hedge? The most effective hedge, in my view, is put options. And one reason for that is it gives you protection if the underlying security goes to zero. The other reason is nonlinearity, which means that a little bit goes a long way, so there's less drag on returns. So to the right, I put an example, and this is from the Portfolio Armor iPhone app. This is SPY, as I'm sure you know, the symbol for the SP500 tracking ETF. And this, as of Monday night, was the optimal put option hedge to protect against a 20% or greater decline in SPY. In other words, if you owned this, this put option right here, and it wouldn't happen, but even if SPY went to zero, you would not be down more than 20% before the expiration of your hedge. And the cost here, as you can see, was 3.52% of position value. So it's a little bit higher than it has been in the past because volatility has been higher. But let's say instead of hedging with puts, you decided to buy an inverse ETF. Because there's a one-to-one -one relationship or an levered one, two-to-one or three-to-one with an inverse ETF, you would have to hold a much larger amount of your assets in the inverse ETF to protect you against the decline in SPY. But because of the nonlinearity of the puts, you would only need an amount equal to 3.52% of your SPY position to protect you against a greater than 20% decline over the next six months uh, as of Monday. And to be conservative, when we calculate that cost, we're always using the ask price. So in reality, it would probably be less because in reality, you can usually purchase an option or sell an option at some price between the bid and the ask. Now, one drawback of hedging is you have to deal with cost. In the case, let's look at the same put option. We have that 3.52% cost. If SPY were to go up, say 10% over six months, over that six month period, and you pay 3.52% to hedge it, your net return would be 10% minus the 3.52. So you would, you would be up about 7.5% rather than 10%. That, that's the cost of hedging. So some questions to bear in mind when you're hedging in, in terms to minimize uh, the cost of it is, first of all, decide how much you're willing to risk. And in this case, the user was willing to risk a 20% decline. That's gonna be a lot cheaper to hedge than just buying an at the money put. So the second thing is look at out of the money puts. And here, the, the value of SPY was 310 as of Monday. So the strike price on this put was 260. That turned out to be the optimal put. That's gonna be a lot cheaper than buying a, it looks like I put an extra period there. Sorry about that. Um, that's not cheaper than buying an at the money put every time. And then what's your max drawdown, including the hedging cost? So here, your max drawdown, when you use this app, is always going to be the threshold you put in. So you're not willing to risk a decline of greater than 20%. You're not going to be down 20%, more than 20%, even including this hedging cost. So what it's doing is it's not looking for puts that'll protect against a greater than 20% decline. It's looking for puts that will protect against a greater than 20% minus the cost of hedging decline. And then another thing you can do to reduce cost is you can compare annualized cost as a percentage of position value using different expiration dates. So here, because this is about a six month time period, the Annualized cost was 7.22%. And this was using our default expiration date, which is always roughly six months out. So it was December 18th. 
I say roughly six months because that depends on the options calendar. In some cases, the closest SPY has a ton of expiration dates available. But with individual stocks, it's not always as many. And sometimes the closest put option expiration to six months out might be five months out or seven months out, something like that. But you can go ahead and click this button, this drop down, and you can pick different times to expiration from a week to a year and a half in many cases. And you can see how that annualized cost compares and you can make a decision about what makes more sense for you to hedge. Now, another way to minimize cost is with collars. What you're doing there is you're giving up potential upside to reduce the cost of hedging. So on the left part of the screen, this is an optimal put hedge on NVIDIA. This is protecting against a greater than 20% decline, no upside cap, and this was, I think, as of Tuesday night, and the cost as a percentage of position value was 8.1%. So it wasn't cheap. The middle and the right are both pieces of the optimal collar if you are willing to limit your upside to 20% over the next six months. Uh, on the iPhone app, this is gonna be, it'll just scroll to give you uh, the full image. But in any case, you cap your upside at 20%. And at the end of that, what you have is you have a put option here, and then you have the cost of that put option offset by the income from a call option you sell here. And at the end of the day, you have a negative cost of $10. So you have a net credit of $10 or 0.03% of position value. So you went from paying a little over $3,000 to hedge to getting collecting $10 to hedge your NVIDIA position. And the difference is in the second case with the optimal collar, you were willing to give up some potential upside. How much should you pay to hedge? This really depends on a couple of questions. One is how much are you up on a position you can't sell? And that's a question that's probably relevant specifically to many in this audience, because many of you have restricted stock at, at companies that you've worked for. You may be up I don't know, 100,000% in some cases, maybe more. So in your situation, you're going to probably be willing to pay significant, significant amount to hedge because it's, it's, you're up so much. Uh, I mean, one specific example historically would be Mark Cuban. I'm sure many of you are aware of the example where his company, I think it was broadcast.com, was purchased by Yahoo, and he hedged that before the dot-com bust in 2000. And he, that's one of the reasons he's still a billionaire today. Now, for regular positions, let's say you're just buying a stock today or an ETF. A question you need to ask yourself is, is the cost of hedging greater than your expected return? So let's say there's an ETF and it's a bond ETF and the average return for it over the last 10 years has been say 5% per year or something like this. Now, it wouldn't make sense to pay more than 5% annualized hedging cost to hedge that ETF if you think your return is only gonna be about in the 5% range because the hedging cost will have, will have uh, absorbed all of your return. Now, if you remember our previous example with NVIDIA, just to go back to that slide for a moment, the cost here was 8.1% of position value to hedge uncapped. That's expensive, but if you think NVIDIA has a chance to go up 30% or 40% over six months, it's not, it's not necessarily uh, the wrong answer. If you only think it has a, a chance to go up 5%, then obviously you don't wanna pay 8% to hedge. Hey David, how, how would you think about um, hedging a single stock position versus hedging a portfolio? Well, let's go back here. If you look at, um, just to jump backward for a moment, with SPY, let's say you had a, a portfolio that was highly correlated to, to the SP 500. And let's say you had hundreds of shares in it or hundreds of different securities. So because you have the hundreds of different securities, 
your stock specific risk was ameliorated by diversification. So you're really concerned with market risk. And in that case, you could do exactly what you suggested, which is just hedge market risk. And the way you could do that is, let's say it's a million dollar portfolio, you could look at the current cost of SPY, the current uh, price of it, divide a million dollars by that, you get a dollar amount, and then you hedge that amount of SPY. And that's gonna protect you against market risk. But if you owned a big position in NVIDIA, hedging market risk, hedging SPY, isn't going to help you if NVIDIA has a huge earnings miss and drops 30%, because the stock market may not be down that much. So if you have a concentrated portfolio, you want to hedge the individual positions. That would be my suggestion. Got it, great. Sure. Let's take another uh, case, Roland, in the case of if you're starting from scratch. You have cash and you're, you want to maximize your return while strictly limiting your risk. So one approach you can take is you start with the universe of hedgeable securities. You then estimate potential returns for them. So you're looking for ones that all else equal have the potential to do better over the next six months or whatever time frame you're using. You then calculate your, their hedging costs then subtract the hedging costs from the potential returns, your potential return estimate. And then what you do is you sort by potential return net of hedging costs, and you buy and hedge a handful of those names, the ones that come to the top of the list. So that's what we call the hedge portfolio method. And I'll, I'll show you guys an example of that. Um, but as you can kind of guess, you have to be good at this part, estimating the potential returns and being good at selecting the securities. So the next slide shows we've done an okay job at that. I mean, this, this particular slide shows a cohort from July 27th where it really knocked the cover off the ball. They're not all, they don't all do that well. But so far we, so our top names have, now I'm having an issue navigating. I need to go back one. Just where click, would one click your, click your left arrow. Left arrow. Left arrow or page up? Right here? Okay. Left arrow. This one here? Oh, left arrow, I'm sorry. Yeah, left arrow or page up. Actually, neither one is working right now. There we go, we're back. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so um, what I was saying was if you're going to use this hedge portfolio method, you need a way to select securities that are going to do, uh, hopefully at least as well as the market, ideally a little bit better so you can cover the cost of hedging. So ours, we've been tracking this live since uh, uh, June of two, 2017. So, so far we have 133 cohorts where we have full six month performance. We, we run these every week. And so far they've outperformed SPY by an average of 0.62% annualized. And, and we're working to increase that outperformance uh, in a number of ways. Now, this is an example of a hedge portfolio created on December 26th of 2019. So six, this is the most recent one that we pretty much have full performance for. And the idea here was you were starting with a blank page. You had uh, $2 million. You were unwilling to risk a decline of more than 20% over six months. And you just said to, to the system, I don't want to risk one 20% decline over six months. I have $2 million try to get me the best return possible while in the worst case scenario, if all of my stocks go to zero, I'm not down more than 20%. And this is what the system would have presented. It had uh, positions in Google, both share classes, um, KLL Tencore, NextEra Energy, Neo Genomics, NVIDIA, the Sherwin-Williams company, Tyler Technologies, um, and a little bit in cash, but it tried to minimize the cash. So only about, uh, four percent, actually, four thousand, fifty to four thousand. So that was about two and a half percent or so. Of the portfolio was in cash. And the the reason why I picked these securities, these were at the top of the list as far as potential returns, net of hedging cost. And the worst case scenario here was a decline of nineteen point seven three percent. And the best case scenario was 
a gain of 17.73% net of hedging cost, which in this case was negative. But the expected return was 6.34% because it's, it takes into account that a lot of times we may predict the stocks can do well. In reality, a lot of these aren't going to do well. So the next slide shows how this performed. Okay, and here's the performance of that portfolio over the next six months as of, yet, uh, as of today's close. It was up 8.92% versus SPY, which was down 3.82%. Now, this doesn't show the positions, but on the website it shows it, and at the end of the presentation, I can pull that up, and there's an actually interactive chart, and you can see how this performed over every single day that it was alive. And putting it together, we talked about scanning for optimal hedges. We have a tool that does that. We talked about, we talked about creating hedge portfolios and we have a tool that does that as well. Our website is portfolioarmor.com and we also have a coupon code for uh, members of the San Francisco American Association of Individual Investors. It's just SFAAII, and you would enter it here. And uh, as I'm doing this, I just realized I didn't set that coupon up. So while you guys are asking questions, I will go ahead and do that. But before I do that, let me see if I can just show you something on the website real quick. Okay, if you go to the website, PortfolioArmor.com, and you go to performance, and you go to tracking portfolios, you can find that portfolio I just showed you. And I'm just gonna scroll down for it. There's a ton of them here, but it's the most recent portfolio hedged against a greater than 20% decline. So this was started in December 26th of last year. And if I hit show positions, and you scroll through, you can see how the values change throughout the whole time. So you can see which ones did well, which ones did poorly, and you get the end result here. But that's something you can do. It's full transparency. So every portfolio we create, you can see that and you can see how they've all done. And you can also see, if you go to top names, you can see how every cohort of top names is done and what was in them. So the, the December 20, Sixth one isn't up yet, but you can see, for example, this was what was in, we had Apple, we had all these other securities, Apple did well, PNC didn't, et cetera. And if you were going to, for the coupon code, that gets entered right here. So that is my presentation. And Roland, if you wanna take it back, I'll be happy to answer any questions and while the questions are queuing up. I'll go ahead and create the coupon code for everybody. To use. Sure. Yeah. Well, you could. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. You because you need a. Um, yeah. Go ahead and um, you could stop your sharing, but we might have to bring it back because um, maybe some people want to reference the slides. But yeah, that's fine. Sure. Um, so, I'll bring it back. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna create the coupon right now. Take two seconds. Perfect. Uh, so feel free to um, type in any of um, your questions and. I'll just start with this question, David, and uh, you're multitasking there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so does your tool, when it does this, uh, finds the optimal hedge, does it take into, um, into account the, um, the intrinsic volatility of the options? Or is that sort of just kind of, you, you, you've, kind of looked, you've kind of looked at the pricing of that as a proxy to the IV of the option? Oh, you're on mute, David. You're on mute. Hey, David, you're you're on mute. Can you hear me now, Roland? I can hear you now. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. I was saying it was a good question, and the answer is what we do is we're not looking at the volatility uh, by itself. I mean, the volatility does impact the cost, but we're looking at we're looking at an option that's going to protect you even if there's no time value left on the option. So we're really basing the protection level on the intrinsic value of the option. 
Oh, I see. So you ignore the time value of the option. Correct. So, and what that means in practical terms is that if we say, I showed the hedge before for, um, and we can put it back if you like, but with the SPY hedge, it said you're going to be down worst case scenario. You're going to be down no more than 20%. That would be, let's say the market declined by 30% on the day before that option expired, you would be down 20%. But if the, if the market declined by 30%, say a month after you bought that hedge, you'd probably be down about 10 or you know, 10% maybe or 8%. I mean, because the time value would give you extra protection. Okay. Um, and David, I think uh, somebody's asking about what's that discount. I, I believe you said that, um, why don't you, uh, what is that discount with that promo code? The discount is 10%, but that's not just, uh, it's, it's a monthly subscription fee. So it's not just for the first month. It would be 10% for every month that you remain a member. And I, I just set that up. So the coupon code is SF, no, it's, it's uh, yeah, SFAAII. For San, All caps. San Francisco AAII. So. Correct, yeah. Um, okay, another question. How do hedges impact tax considerations of the portfolio? Now, obviously, you're not a CPA, but... Right, so <laughs> I would preface it by saying I'm not an accountant, but I think in general, it's probably not something you need to worry about because any gain on the hedge is going to be more than offset by the loss in the underlying security. Um, because these hedges, there's no hedge out there I can think of that is going to protect you against a 0% decline. I mean, it's kind of difficult to set that up. So you're, you're paying a cost to hedge. And I mean, let's say you, you have a, in the simplest case, you have a portfolio where it's just SPY shares, and then you have, you have those puts on SPY, right? Mm -hmm. And the market drops by 30%, and your SPY puts are up 30 times or something like that. But the overall value of your portfolio is down. So at the end of the, day, at the, end of the year, you have capital loss. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is the expected return in the computations the annualized compounded rate using daily data? No, the expected return in our hedge portfolios, what we do is this, we, we start with a potential return estimate, which is kind of a high-end estimate. And then what we do is we look historically at the, the ratio of actual returns, like how our previous picks have actually done. And we come up with, and this is updated every day, I think the current figure is something like 0 0.26, something in that range. So the actual return of one of the securities we pick is going to be 0 0.26 times the potential return. And that plus subtracting out the hedging cost is how we get the expected return. Okay. So Does that make sense? Um, yeah, that, that question came from PK. So PK, if, uh, if you have additional questions, feel free to type it in. While he's typing it rolling, just to elaborate real quickly. Yeah. Every time we come up with a potential return, the potential return is positive because, uh, well, we're ruling out some stocks, but Ones that end up in a portfolio are going to positive returns because by definition, we're not going to put something in there that we don't think is going to have a positive return. But in reality, some of them are going to have negative returns. So that explains why the actual return is less than the potential return. And we use the aggregate difference between the two to come up with an expected return. So over time, the expected return should be very, should be very accurate. We'll have periods where it's going to, the actual return is going to underperform the expected return, and we'll have periods where it's going to outperform as it did in that portfolio I, I just shared. But over time, it should, it should kind of even out. Okay, great. And then uh, next question here is, in this volatile market, don't you have the risk of being stopped out and potentially lose future gains? Um, do you understand that question? David. I understand the question and the I'm technical guessing. term isn't really being, it's not, he's not really talking about being stopped at. I think he's talking about your underlying security being called away if he's a caller. And it, go ahead. It's either that or I interpreted it as um, that, uh, you know, you pay for the hedge, but then, 
but then the market does a head fake and then now you've paid the hedge for nothing, you know, um, you, you've, you, you know, so anyways, um, Mahendra, if you, if you've got, um, you know, sort of, I guess, clarify your question, uh, just, you know, type that back in. So oh, while he, he's doing oh, that, he didn't mean, okay. he didn't mean call away. He said, call the way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right. If you use a collar, that is a risk. Now, because of that, one thing we've built in, one kind of analytics to our hedge portfolio method is we looked at the, uh, when does it make sense to hedge with a, with a collar and when does it make sense to hedge with puts? And here's how we figured that out. And I'm just clicking on something. I don't think you can see my screen, but it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, actually, you know what? I'm gonna share the screen one more time. Yeah, Let me take see it back. If I can get back in here, take it back. Hold on one more. Sure. Okay, this is from our admin panel. These are calibration factors, but this one in particular, put preference, and it shows 1.79. What this means is, over years of doing hedge portfolios, we found that if you take the same security and you hedge it with a put or you hedge it with a collar, the position hedge with a put has a gross return, that means not including hedging cost, of 1.79 times higher than hedging it with a collar. And the reason for that is, is, is just what your, um, what your, your questioner suggested. It's that if the underlying security does really well when it's hedged with a collar, it's gonna get called away. So hedging with puts exposes you to the outliers where what we do is if we're gonna hedge something with a collar, we're gonna set that cap at our estimate of our potential return estimate, which is a bullish estimate. We'll say to ourselves, well, this is what the system is kind of saying. We think this stock in, in a bullish scenario can go up 25%. So we're gonna cap it at 25%. But there are gonna be cases where we think it's gonna do 25% and it may be a 50, and we're not gonna capture that if it's called away. So that 1.79 figure takes into account thousands and thousands of instances and it says your, your actual return is 1.79 times higher when you hedge your puts. So that raises a question of why don't you always hedge your puts? But remember, that's your gross return, not your net return, because it's always cheaper to hedge with a collar. So the calculation that our system makes is it compares the potential return both ways. It looks at it if it's hedged with a collar and taking account the lower cost. And if it's hedged with a put, taking into account the chance of a higher gain. And then it sees which one gives the higher. So basically what it's doing is it's taking, it's taking the, the potential return we have and subtracting the hedging cost in both cases. And then for the put, we're multiplying that net potential return by 1.79 because that's the, ac that's the average actual uh, advantage that it has hedging with the puts. And if that is higher than the, the cost, then the, the, the potential return of the collar, we go with a put. If it's not, we go with a collar. Okay. Does that make sense? I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it can be complicated when you explain it that way, but the point I want to get across is we're taking that into account when we construct hedge portfolios. So we have a bias towards using puts when the cost is similar. Yeah. So Mahendra says, uh, thanks. So. I okay. You, thanks for the question. I believe you nailed it. So, um, most companies do not allow employees to use put and call options for their company stock options. Um, I would assume that in the, in the actual um, account. So how did, how, how did the Yahoo example you mentioned work? If I remember correctly, um, Mark Cuban had that, had that restriction as well. And what he did was, I think he was, he was instructing his advisors to hedge the NASDAQ, for example. I think using QQQ, ETFs like that. So what he looked for things, he looked for things that uh, he thought would correlate strongly with Yahoo shares. Okay. Um, some folks are asking, um, can, can they contact you? So um, yeah, the, um, if, you go to, uh, if you go to David's website, um, you know, there's, there's David's contact information if, if you'd like to reach out to him. Um, yeah, it's, it's just contact at portfolioarmor.com. And um, 
one thing, just you know what, just coincidence. Uh, yesterday, I, I received an email from a longtime subscriber of Portfolio Armor who happens to be a financial advisor in Silicon Valley. So I don't know what the mix is with this chapter, if, if a lot of you work with financial advisors or not, but if there's some of you who do or are interested in one, um, that's at least one person I, I, I could refer you to that's in your area. But it also, if you have any just general questions, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to answer any of them I can. Um, let's see. So does the tool support put spread as a hedge rather than just a straight put? It does not support put spreads. It really focuses on uh, optimal puts and optimal collars. Is there an option, an optional performance choice among different percent declines? And I believe the answer to that is, oh, is there an optimal performance choice among different percent declines? So I believe, yes, you can utilize the uh, solution to hedge like the, the, for, you know, the, the 10%, 20%, 30% decline, right? So. You can definitely pick exactly what percentage decline you're willing to hedge against, whether, and you could do 17%, 13%. You can do anything as small as 2% on the hedge portfolios. But if the person is asking what I think they're asking, they may be asking what is, uh, what's the best decline to hedge against to get the best kind of return bang for the buck? And it's a good question. In the last few months, I would never have expected this, but we've seen portfolios hedged against um, declines as small as 4% do really well. If I could just take back the screen, I'll, I'll show you, uh, Roland. Sure. If you don't mind. Okay. Um, um, you're not. Okay. So yeah, go ahead. Grab it back. Um, I, I'm not muted again, am I? No, no, you're not muted. Okay. okay. All right. Can you see? Um, mm -hmm. Let me get out of this. Hold on. Yeah, we see your screen. Okay. Just one sec. All right. So just go into the homepage tracking portfolios again. So here, these are the ones hedged against 4% declines. And this kind of surprised me, but going back, remember all these portfolios last six months. So going back to October, uh, October 31st, the expected return for this portfolio is 1.84. The actual term is 9.84, while S&P was down 3.8%. And we saw one, two, you know, a number of these portfolios did really well. I think to some extent, um, this is one of them. This is a portfolio created on November 21st, hedged against a uh, greater than 4% decline. Um, here's what's interesting about it. The reason this did well is because when you're looking to hedge against a decline as small as 4%, it really restricts the number of securities you can get. And what this ended up picking up was a lot of um, precious metals ETFs, like GLD, SGOL. It also got some fixed income ETFs. So those ended up doing really well in a, in a market when, when stocks were going down. So what we did was we kind of used that information to come up with a calibration factor. And you see here, what this is saying is, if a security is hedgeable against a greater than 4% decline, how much better does it do than other securities? And what this number shows as of June 25th, in aggregate, they do about 2.45% better over six months. So that's all built in to our security selection process. So um, short answer is, because of that, all else equal, if we're doing it right, the more risk you take on, the higher your potential return should be. So what I would do if I'm creating a hedge portfolio is I would just use the level of risk you're willing to tolerate. If you can tolerate, if you can only tolerate a 10% decline, use 10%. If you can tolerate a 20% decline, use 20%. And you'll probably, all else equal, you'll end up with a better return over time than you would in the 10% one. The other thing you can do too to smooth out your returns is let's say you have a million dollars to invest or a hundred thousand dollars to invest. Uh, let's take the million, for example, rather than putting it all to work in one hedge portfolio. Now you could put half in one now and half in three months, or you could split it in thirds and put a third in now and a third in two months. 
and so on. Each one lasts six months. So in the in a year, you'll have four different portfolios if you split your your money into two tranches, and you'll have six portfolios if you split it into three. From Bill, do you have a tool to determine when to put the hedge and when the hedge is not needed? That's a very good question. And I would say the short answer would be no, because we really don't know if a black swan is going to happen. But here's something interesting. If you use the, the hedging app and you look at hedging against a greater than 9% decline, what we found is in our research, securities where it's possible to do that with puts tend to do better than securities that can't be hedged that way. And I think the reason is because they go down less. They, t they tend to go, they don't go down as much. And that's reflected in the hedging cost because options market participants tend to be sophisticated investors. And they tend to think these aren't, they're wrong sometimes, but overall they tend to be right more often than not. And if you don't mind, just to, um, it looks like someone asked a question, Eugene Krasnovsky. Um, but it looks like there's a private question here, so I'll just type an answer. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, uh, then we have, uh, does this method work for portfolio with mutual funds? Mutual funds don't have options traded on them, so you couldn't, you, you can't hedge them directly, um, but you can hedge market risk with a mutual fund by by uh, buying puts on an equal amount, equal dollar amount of a similar ETF. So for example, if you're in a mutual fund that tracks the S&P 500, you could buy puts in SPY to protect. If you're in one that tracks bonds, you could use a bond ETF and do something similar like that. Yep, makes sense. Um... Hey, hey, David, just on that, on that question, like, so I'm sure I asked you this, but I forget. The answer, you, you don't do any kind of beta weighting, right, on the portfolio in determining how many equivalent SP, SPYs to buy, correct? SPY options to buy. Th that's correct. We don't do that because we're looking strictly at, we want to protect you regardless of what happens. So regardless of the volatility situation, at the expiration date of the put, we want you to be protected according to your risk tolerance. Okay. Sorry about now, that. if it, yeah, no, no problem at all. Yeah, but if um, what that means is, if if you look for a hedge against say a greater than twenty percent decline, a greater than ten percent decline, that's your decline in the worst case scenario. You may be down less than that. Okay. Sorry, Bobby. Go ahead. Uh, last question: uh, What's offered in the app versus the website? That's another great question. What the app gives you with uh. With just the download, the app gives you the ability to scan for optimal put options expiring approximately six months out. And then there are in-app subscriptions that allow you to expand that to look at different expiration dates. And there's a second in-app subscription that allows you to uh, use optimal collars so you can offset the cost with, with the calls. And then there's a final in-app subscription which shows you our top 10 names every day based on our security selection process. The website includes all of that stuff that I just mentioned. And in addition, it also includes that hedge portfolio construction tool. Got it. I've got a couple more that uh, came yeah. in. If, um, oh, but just to clarify one thing, Roland, if you don't mind, because sure. this comes up occasionally, sometimes people will download the iPhone app and then they'll try to go to the website and log in and say, it's not letting me in. They're separate products. The, the website has more capability. Also, the billing for the app is handled through Apple. So just bear that in mind, it's, it's separate products. Okay, um, if I have a portfolio of many stocks, closed end funds, et cetera, et cetera, what might be the recommended path forward using the tool to, in order to achieve market risk hedging? The individual has closed-end funds and stocks in their, in their uh, account? Yeah. He said many stocks, closed-end funds, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. 
if you're just looking to hedge, uh, what you'd want to do is try to get a sense for, for how you're allocated, broadly speaking, in terms of, in terms of stocks and bonds. I mean, if, if, uh, if, you're, if you decide I'm 60% in stocks, I'm 40% in bonds, then what you might want to do to hedge market risk would be you could buy optimal puts on SPY for the stock portion if it's mostly those kind of stocks. And you could buy optimal puts on a bond ETF. <clears throat> Excuse me, if it's if you have that much in in bonds, and you could do a similar process if if some of your stocks are are like um, you know precious metal stocks that kind of thing. That that's one approach. The other approach would be if you're willing to sell these things, you could just start with a blank blank sheet of paper like our hedge portfolio uh, our hedge portfolio method, and then just say I have this much money show me the best way to maximize my returns while strictly limiting my risk. Okay. Um, question is, uh, this hedging methodology can be used um, across both taxable and tax deferred accounts? Yes, no? Yes, you, you, in, in most, uh, you check with your individual broker, but most IRAs do allow you to, uh, to use options if you have options of authority at your brokerage. Um, probably, I don't know, most 401k is probably not, but in, in IRAs, yes, you usually yeah. have that. And let me just uh, clarify one thing too, uh, regarding the, the previous question, portfolio armor enables you when you're creating a hedge portfolio, my preference would be just to not enter any tickers, just to put a dollar amount and let the site pick everything for you. But you can also put in securities you have and it will try to include them and, and hedge them. So with the previous questioner, that would work with some of the stocks, but it wouldn't work obviously with closed end funds because those don't have options traded on them. Okay, and then last question, does the portfolio change over six months? Over the six months, I'm... No, the portfolio wouldn't change. The idea would be to hold each position for six months or until just before the hedge expires, whichever comes first. So, and we're looking for hedges that expire about six months out. Um, so the idea would be you hold that portfolio, but to smooth out returns, as I said before, you can start one portfolio today, one portfolio in two months or something like that. Over time, your actual return should track with the expected returns. So if anyone comes up with anything uh, after my email address, contact at portfolioarmor.com, I'd be happy to help. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great evening and um, appreciate you sharing your experience and uh, uh, insights with us, David. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, guys.